Do you know that, the Soviet Union has made the world's first supersonic VTOL aircraft? Moreover it is widely believed that the Lockheed's VTOL F-35B variant shares many basic features with this Soviet super machine. Welcome back to our channel. Here we are discussing about one of the marvelous engineering feat of Soviet era. For those who are not watched the video of Soviet-made giant sea monster aircraft, please watch it from the link given in description. Let's start. The origins of Soviet jet, vertical takeoff and landing, VTOL remain obscure in the West. It is known that in the mid-1950s the Soviets developed their first jet VTOL platform, a test rig comparable to the British Rolls-Royce, flying bedstead, rig and apparently known as the Turbolin. During the 1960s, the British Hawker Siddeley Company, later part of British Aerospace, developed a VTOL demonstrator named the Kestrel, which would lead to a production successor, the famous Harrier VTOL fighter. The Bristol Company, bought out by Rolls-Royce during the decade, developed a VTOL engine named the Pegasus, for the Kestrel. The USSR followed the development of the Kestrel and Pegasus with interest, and in 1961 the authorities had tasked the Yakovlev OKB to build a jet VTOL demonstrator, which would emerge as the Yak-36. The Tuminsky Engine Design Bureau was tasked with taking the R-27300 turbojet, then in development for what would become the MiG-23 fighter, and developing a non-afterburning vectored thrust version, the R-27B300, with two to be used to power the Yak-36. The Yak-36 had a configuration somewhat along the lines of the Kestrel, with the engines arranged around the center of gravity of the aircraft, a set of puffers for low-speed control, and retractable bicycle landing gear straddling the engines, with wingtip outrigger landing gear. Early flights suffered from re-ingestion of exhaust gases back into the engine, and so a set of fences was installed under the aircraft to keep the exhaust gases out of the engine intakes. The twin-engine arrangement posed a flight hazard. If one engine failed, the aircraft would immediately flip over onto its back. That led to work on a system that would automatically eject the pilot if a VTOL aircraft seemed to be departing from safe vertical flight parameters. While the Yak-38 and its later modernized Yak-38M variant fulfilled the role of a fleet defense strike fighter for the Soviet Navy, but the aircraft were considered obsolete almost immediately due to the many shortcomings they had, such as a very poor range of less than 100 kilometers, difficulty operating in hot weather, inability to operate at night due to lack of radar or advanced targeting systems, horrible controllability and maneuverability due to the heavy weight and high wing loading, and a small combat payload among other things. As early as 1973, the general designer Alexander Yakovlev, went back to the drawing board to create a new generation of VTOL fighters for the Soviet Navy. The successor aircraft project outlined a set of requirements. The new aircraft had to be supersonic, incorporate an advanced fire control system and radar, sensor suite, allow for a larger range of operations, and include a larger array of weapons. At the time of the project, no aircraft like this existed in the world, and the only equivalent that came close was the French Dassault Balzac V prototype. After many years of research and development, the design was finalized and submitted for review in June of 1980. The design invoked many new technologies not yet standardized in the Soviet Union, such as composite materials and advanced radars. Many setbacks with the R-79B engine and the radar development programs caused the development schedule of the Yak-41 to be delayed by a few years. In 1983, the first static, non-flying, prototype was completed, and static ground testing commenced until the radar, engine, and fly-by-wire, power-by-wire systems were completed. The first flying prototype was soon completed and on March 9, 1987 and performed its maiden flight. The second prototype was a more definitive, Yak-41 prototype, and this time including most of its avionics and fire control system. The Yak-41 showed great promise, and at this stage of flight testing started setting many world records. To keep its development and true identity secret, the Soviet Union registered the aircraft as the Yak-141 instead of Yak-41 with international record-keeping agencies, hence where the 141 designation comes from. The Yak-41 program was proceeding smoothly at that point, with many flight tests scheduled and performed successfully over the next few years. Most notably, 
By 1991 the Yak-41s had flown to Severomorsk-1 airbase and successfully performed carrier trials and testing, including both VTOL and STOL operations from the carriers Baku, later renamed Admiral Gorshkov, in anticipation of future service deployment aboard the new and upcoming Type 1143.5 carrier TBLC, later renamed to Admiral Kuznetsov, after the aircraft is accepted into service in the upcoming years. However, as promising as the aircraft was, the program was ultimately terminated in 1992 due to lack of funding after the collapse of the USSR. The Yakovlev Design Bureau then started trying to find foreign investors and buyers for the aircraft. Shortly after, a very unlikely foreign investor appeared at Yakovlev's doorstep, as Lockheed Corporation started negotiations for further funding more Yak-141 prototypes. The first public appearance of the Yak-41 occurred famously at the 1992 Farnborough Airshow in the United Kingdom. However, the Yak-41s would be banned from performing vertical takeoffs after a few days at the airshow due to excessive wear to the runway, a testament to the powerful thrust from the engines in vertical flight. Shortly after, Yakovlev had announced that they had successfully reached an agreement with Lockheed for $4 million US dollar in funding for two more flying prototypes, a twin-seat trainer prototype, and a single static, non-flying, testbed to test improvements in avionics. It is widely believed that many of the technological advancements from the Yak-41 program would be directly applied by Lockheed through their partnership to the, the Joint Strike Fighter program, most notably the later VTOLF 35B variant, which shares many basic features with the Yak-41. Finally the two flyable prototypes, now no longer flyable and being placed in museums for permanent display. The first flyable prototype retained its post-Soviet white 141 livery, and is permanently displayed at the Central Air Force Museum at Monino. The second prototype was repainted into the white 75 livery originally used by its sister aircraft, and placed in the Technical Museum, Arkhangelskoy, Moscow. If you are more interested in these topics, please comment us for more exploration. If you are not subscribed our channel, please subscribe and share it. Thanks for watching. Stay curious.